Welcome investors to the Absolute Return Podcast, your source for stock market analysis, global macro musings, and hedge fund investment strategies. Your hosts, Julian Klamachko and Michael Kesslering, aim to bring you the knowledge and analysis you need to become a more intelligent and wealthier investor. This episode is brought to you by Accelerate Financial Technologies. Accelerate, because performance matters. Find out more at accelerateshares.com. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Absolute Return Podcast, Episode 7. Today is March 29th, 2019. I am your host, Julian Klamachko. And I'm Mike Kessler. We're really excited to chat about a bunch of things this week. We'll talk about various stock market timing signals, including CAPE, dividend yield, the Baltic Dry Index, market cap to GDP, and the yield curve. We'll give you an update on a Brexit, which is an unmitigated disaster, so we're pretty excited to talk about that. A big news in the financial advisor space with Schwab launching a $30 per month subscription service. In technology, Apple expanded its services offering with TV, finance, gaming, and news offerings. Ride hailing firm Lyft goes public. And lastly, we'll chat about uh, the Canadian yield inverting as it recently followed its U.S. brethren. What we mean by the Canadian yield curve inverting, that refers to the 10-year Canadian government bond. That yield dipped below that of the three-month Canadian Treasury bill yield. So that is the inverted yield curve. And it's a pretty big deal because there are numerous implications for this. Uh, First, I want to chat about why this happened. Well, we got to look at two things. Number one, we look at the front end of the curve, the short dated paper being the the three month treasury bill yield. And that typically follows what the Bank of Canada is setting at as its uh, benchmark rate. So over the past number of years, the Bank of Canada has been hiking off uh, credit crisis, low interest rates. And so that has brought up short term yields. Then on the back end, looking at the, the 10 year bond, what has brought that down and it's come down pretty dramatically i remember back in november it was north of 2.5 percent and now uh this week i believe it's in the 1.54 percent range so that's firmly below inflation which means a uh, negative real yield for 10 years but in any event they say that the yield curve is the best economist out there. It has numerous market implications, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I guess in, in terms of being the, the best economist out there, um, I just first wanted to point out kind of its its spotty track record is that so it has successfully signaled a recession in the early 1990s, but then gave false positives of recessions in 1986 and 2000, where they actually didn't show up as well inverted in 2006, which was well ahead of the uh, 2008 crisis. And this um, is Canada, right? Yes, yes. This is focused on Canada and also failed to predict the recession in 2015. So I think it just kind of highlights the importance of testing, whether it be a macro factor or more of a micro factor across different geographies and locations as the yield curve inversion at using it as a factor for predictive value has worked out in the US, but not so much in Canada, Japan, um, certain areas of Europe. So I was just wondering, you know, do you think there's any systematic or, you know, economic reason that it hasn't had the predictive power that it's had in the US, in Canada and abroad? Yeah, it's tough to say. Certainly, there's some unique dynamics in different markets. You know, Japan has had very, very low interest rates for a very long time and a very flat yield curve. So an inversion really doesn't mean nearly as much over there as it does here. And that's a much more, I'd consider, manipulated market. with The Bank of Japan really loading up on uh, bonds, uh, JGBs or Japanese government bonds. Another thing I wanted to talk about is what this means for interest rate levels at the Bank of Canada. And so I indicated over the past few years, they've been on this rate hiking cycle, but what an inverted yield curve does, it takes all of that right off the table. Like uh, no central banker would would hike rates into an inverted yield curve. And what some economists are now predicting, I saw one calling for three three rate hikes, two to, two to three rate hikes in the next uh, 12 to 18 months. Certainly the market is starting to price that in. Uh, and certainly not pricing in any rate hike increases this year. And so if you are, say, looking for a mortgage, keep that in mind that we might start seeing interest rates come down. You might be able to benefit from a variable rate mortgage if the Bank of Canada 
cuts their target rate by you know 0.75 percent which would be three rate cuts you could see a dramatic decline in your mortgage rate on your house now do you think there's a possibility of three rate cuts without a recession it's tough to say a lot of it depends on what they're doing at the fed bank of canada policy typically follows what they're doing in the u.s and the the reason they do that is really to try to manage the currency they don't want uh, the loony to rally too hard which would be uh, you know pretty punishing on the economy. Another big variable is the price of oil. Uh, the price of oil, WTI and Brent have, have been doing well, but uh, a lot of the, the pricing that Canadian producers receive has been at a big discount. So that's been tough for the Canadian economy as well. Alberta recently had uh, you know forced production cuts, which really affected the Q4 economic numbers. So seeing a lot of uh, slowdown in the economic numbers in Canada. And if we look outside the country, uh, you're seeing something similar globally. I mean, pretty poor numbers coming out of China and Europe. So everything is is pretty much one system. So one country can't be looked at um, in a vacuum. It, you really need to take a global perspective of what's going on in Europe, what's going on in Asia, because those really affect what's going on in Canada and the U.S. from a central bank perspective, from an economic perspective, and lastly, from a stock market perspective. Big IPO hitting the market today with Lyft going public on the NASDAQ. It popping, what, 8% on its first day. It started the day off quite a bit higher, probably around 15, 16%, but sort of declining into the end of the day. I should mention that it was priced off a $72 IPO price, and this was actually upsized, or the range was increased. They, they initially went out at $62 to $68 per share, and then just two days into their road show, the book was entirely covered, meaning all the money they're raising, which was over $2 billion, there was demand after two days of marketing to investors. So certainly a, a very strong IPO, a lot of demand. I want to talk about some fundamentals on the company here. And so they had uh, over $2 billion in revenue in 2018. This is up from, from $343 million in 2016. But should also mention that they are suffering uh, increasing losses each year. So on that $2.16 billion in revenue in 2018, they actually posted a loss of $911 million. So nearly $1 billion uh, negative net income into their IPO. And I believe that is the largest for a startup uh, going public. What are your thoughts on this deal? Yeah, I just wanted to bring up the their insurance reserves, actually. In some good reporting from the Financial Times, they mentioned that on their, their about $2.2 billion worth of revenue in 2018, that Lyft accumulated about $430 million in insurance reserves. That's about 20%. So those insurance reserves are actually placed in cost of goods sold, therefore lowering their gross margins. So that brings their gross margins to only about 42%, which is substantially lower than a typical enterprise software business that people thought they might be valued similar to. Mm -hmm. And so what they have been doing is burning through those reserves quite quickly. Uh, Their losses paid out um, in 2018 were about 59% of their insurance reserves going into the year. So why I'm bringing this up is that, number one, looking at the company, it's a low gross margin business with potentially a risk asymmetry in terms of the insurance reserves, in terms of whether whether they could be actually under-reserving, since they do have limited operational history, don't really know if those insurance reserves will be sufficient to cover their future losses. So it's something to consider when looking at this company and how important insurance is to to this company overall. Yeah, I wanted to touch on uh, two uh, future dynamics of of Lyft and these ride-sharing companies. Number one is their path to profitability, both Lyft and Uber have been just burning a ton of cash. And when Lyft went public in their marketing, they had zero plan to get to profitability, which obviously as an investor is a, is a huge concern. They, uh, they're they certainly growing revenue significantly, but how are they going to convert those massive losses into profit, especially when they're against a, 
you know, a voracious competitor such as Uber, who now has 70% market share. Lyft was and always has been the underdog. They've battled to a 30% market share. But in my opinion, it's starting to become a somewhat commoditized product. It's difficult to raise prices, not because those two are in such intense competition, but you obviously also have the legacy taxi drivers, which you know, could undercut any potential price increases. So that's uh, another interesting dynamic right there. Yeah, in terms of competition, something that the founders mentioned on Bloomberg today uh, in their interview was that they view their number one competition as car ownership. Um, so that's an, that's an interesting take that they have on their on their business. Another aspect that I was looking at today is um, with this IPO, who's making money? And so their co-founders, their stakes are worth a combined $1.4 or ish billion, um, it may have gone down a slightly, wow. but also, uh, yeah, which is which is a, a lofty amount. But also, GM General Motors actually has a stake of six point eight percent of the company, which is worth about one point four billion, one point five billion as well. Um, so that's kind of interesting. But in terms of the actual IPO itself, Julian, how does an investment banker actually price an IPO? Yeah, there's a lot of art that goes into it. Uh, they have to get, correctly gauge uh, investor demand. They go out marketing and get some feedback and see how the uh, the book of orders really builds. And as you see this one, they went out with an initial range, which which I assume that they solicited heavy investor input previously. And from that range, uh, as they booked orders, they actually ended up increasing it by uh, nearly 20%. Uh, but ultimately, what some of these IPO pops, when you get a, an IPO going up 20 30% or even more the first day, you got to wonder, is that a poor job on the investment banker's side? You got uh, you got two interests to balance. You want to balance the company getting the money. You don't want to sell their shares too cheaply, but you also want investors taking the risk on the stock to show a gain as well. So you're trying to balance those two in- interests, trying not to leave too much money on the table, while trying not to have an IPO that tanks the first day. One aspect of these private companies is they've raised, as you indicated, a lot of money in the private markets. For example, Lyft just did around uh, last year when they're private at 15 billion. Now in the public markets, they're being valued at 24 billion. You talked about GM. Well, GM invested half a billion at a five and a half billion dollar round. I know Carl Icahn got in this one pretty early. I think he led uh, around, he had about a 10x return over the years. And the Japanese company Rakuten led a $680 million round in 2015. So a lot of players got positioned in this one and certainly a lot of private market investors showing pretty substantial gains. But this is another IPO where we're seeing the multi-voting shares, isn't it? Absolutely. And you know something that's a uh, common theme in our podcast is corporate governance. And so in terms of the founders themselves, I, themselves, I mentioned that their stake's worth in that you know, $1.4 billion range, but they actually own, so indicating that they only actually own about 5% of the economic version of the company. But in terms of voting rights, they actually own 49% of the voting rights for the company, which is, uh, although below 50%, it effectively gives them control of the company. Yeah, you know my attitude, one share, one vote. I believe we will see Uber coming public shortly, at least this year, most likely. And I think Uber is going to not go with the dual share class structure. And so that's positive. I mean, the more companies that use it, I believe that's negative for capital markets. I'm always a big fan of uh, equality within shareholders. So we'll see where these uh, new startups come public at. Absolutely. And in terms of Uber, I, it's, I read an interesting tweet the other day that was indicating that if Travis Kalnick, the uh, former CEO of and founder of, of Uber, who is uh, has a very colored history with the mm-hmm. company, um, but it, known as being ultra competitive, that if he still was involved in the company, that likely they would have filed their S1 last night after, uh, after Lyft came out with their indicated pricing to effectively try to kill the the demand the next morning when the shares started trading, which would have been a really interesting (laughs) competitive dynamic. Yeah, that would have been interesting to see. But for now, Uber has not filed yet, but we'll be on the lookout for that one. 
Big news out of Apple this week as they showcase new offerings in TV, finance, gaming, and news. So they're really trying to transition from an iPhone-centric company to a more services-oriented company. And the reason is their iPhone sales have really plateaued. I believe uh, last quarter they reduced guidance. The market's kind of getting saturated with iPhones and each subsequent version hasn't really had the game-changing nature to get consumers to upgrade. And so what they're looking to do is capitalize on their massive billion plus uh, device user base and earn more revenue from those devices through services such as these, which offer more uh, recurring revenue, which investors like to see. And clearly that's much better uh, for the company's financials. And let's get into the details of what they're offering. So number one, they're offering the Apple Card, which is their uh, foray into credit and financial services. They actually teamed up with Goldman to offer a digital credit card that's supposed to, supposedly uh, much cheaper than any other offerings out there. Then they're offering Apple News, uh, $9.99 per month monthly service that gives you access to 300 plus magazines. Apple Arcade, which is a gaming subscription service. And on this one, they're actually gonna have exclusive games. And one of the biggest ones is uh, their Apple TV app. So TV Plus, which they're gonna have, uh, I believe a lot of exclusive content. I, I think that they're going to invest uh, 1 billion annually in producing content. But I mean, that really pales in comparison to what Netflix and HBO are investing into their offerings. And I really wanted to comment that the, the online content and scripted original series market seems to really be getting saturated. There were 496 series in 2018, which is, which is massive growth. It grew 40% since 2014 in terms of the number of streaming shows. If you talk to people, there's pretty much just too many options out there and, and too many shows that no one is watching. And uh, you got Netflix, who's just producing a ton of original content. You got HBO and now Disney coming out with a, a streaming app as well. So what are your thoughts on this whole dynamic and what Apple's up to? think they can compete? Yeah, so your comment on, on Netflix and what they're spending is they spent $12 billion on content in 2018, and they plan to spend $15 billion in 2019. Now, Apple, they have a cash a cash balance of what, $120 billion? A huge they, cash hoard, yeah. They, they have a massive cash hoard, so they have no problem with spending that amount of money. But the issue, I guess, is whether they have the organizational willpower to do so. Being a cash cow business, uh, their 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 business lines right now are just generating a ton of free cash flow. Mm -hmm. But with that in mind, basically competing with Netflix, because they have a lower subscriber base, is that if they're going to bid on similar shows um, as Netflix and similar you know, talent, they will have to pay, you know, the same or more as Netflix. The issue being is that they, by definition, having a lower user base, if they're charging a similar amount for the services, they'll have a lower break even or a higher break even cost. Mm -hmm. And so as a company, if they're losing money on a number of these shows, you know, shareholders may react poorly to that and not be able to see the long term strategic strategic necessity of paying up for content. So that's that's something to keep in mind here. Yeah, the thing about Apple is they just have a massive built in competitive advantage because everyone uses their devices. Right. So if they want to get into a business and look at all the business models they effectively invented, they invented the podcast. So thank you. Apple. They also invented, uh, effectively invented streaming, streaming music as well. So they can really get into these markets and, and dominate. So we'll see how they do. And I wouldn't bet against them. And they still have the iPhone cash cow, which pr provides a tremendous amount of free cash flow annually. And they have been utilizing a substantial portion of that free cash flow to buy back stock and issue a dividend. So if they can uh, invest in growth initiatives as well, I think shareholders would be fairly um, you know, receptive to that as long as, uh, as it fits within a balanced capital allocation program. And it seems like that really is the case. A billion dollars a year isn't that significant when it comes to Apple, obviously. So Absolutely. And then in terms of sentiment, I found it interesting with the Apple card is that the just looking at the sentiment is that the public seems to be more worried 
about Apple having more information on their customers than they are about Goldman Sachs having more information on customers, which is a far cry from uh, from how the public perceived the large investment banks post-crisis uh, as opposed to now. Oh, yes, the vampire squid. We'll, we'll see how the, all this plays out. I think Apple's onto something here. I went a bet against them, and they're likely to be tremendously successful, in my opinion. So we're pretty excited about these services, and I'll likely subscribe to all of them and then, and then see, uh, see how they go. Interesting news in financial planning. So we have a Schwab debuting a subscription-based financial advice service for only $30 per month. So this is uh, perhaps a shot across a bow or even a neutron bomb on the financial advisor business. So advisors have long stuck to a 1% of assets fee, which for a million-dollar account is $10,000 a year for advice, and some advisors certainly provide uh, very valuable advice, but there's a number of financial services companies looking to undercut that, and thus far, Schwab is by far the most aggressive. Uh, so certainly big implications for advisors and just the way people handle their investments in general. And so I got an example here, if we do look at an advisor uh, portfolio. And what, what this Schwab service does, it actually gives you access to a certified financial planner. So it's not a robo-advisor. Schwab actually has a robo-advisor that is free. They don't charge anything for it. But this service, they call Schwab Intelligent Portfolios Premium Service, it actually gives you unlimited access to a cert certified financial planner. So it seems pretty interesting. And if we look at an example on a million dollar portfolio, the standard 1% advisor would charge $10,000 per year. Another firm, Betterment, they have a service for uh, what would be $4,000 per year, 0.4%. Vanguard's at 0.3% or three grand. So this Schwab fee, which 30 bucks a month is $360 per year, is a massive discount, not just to advisors, so north of 95% lower, but it's even you know one-tenth of their competitors, Vanguard and Betterment. Uh, certainly that that changes as the uh, the total assets decline, but certainly a massive change in the financial advisor space. And I certainly think that we're going to see a lot more of this. If you look at the fund management space, it's become commoditized where you can get uh, S&P 500 ETF or these broad-based index ETFs for uh, just 0 0.03, 0 0.05%. So you've had a lot of fee wars in that area. Now we see the fee wars coming to the financial advisor side. So what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I really see this as the ETF issuers, whether they're being forced to or just choosing to through competitive dynamics, getting closer to the end customers. And what I find interesting is the strategies pursued by these different ETF issuers. So Vanguard and Schwab, they've launched their own wealth management services, as you had mentioned Schwab's, but Vanguard Advisory Services, they only charge a 0.3% fee, and that can get all the way down to just five basis points. Whereas BlackRock, who issues iShares, they're targeting technology services that advisors use, and they've targeted that through acquisitions as opposed to building their own. And then State Street actually has chosen not to compete at all with advisors, using that as a differentiating selling point. Mm -hmm. um, however, their flows still trail Vanguard and Schwab. And so one aspect that I did want to touch on as well is the question always, always comes is how is Vanguard able to pursue such a low cost strategy? And yes, economies of scale do matter. But the other aspect is that they actually have no profit motive, uh, that the company is effectively owned by its funds. And so what that means is that they're utilizing a mutual ownership model, which operates the company at cost, so exactly what the, co the funds cost to produce, and then uses the profit to further reduce investor fees. So it's really just a completely different model than these other players have, where they actually are looking to make an economic profit mm -hmm. from the management of these funds. And so I guess, you know, Julian, where, where do you see us going from here? Well, I think on the ETF side and the asset management side, those fees are rock bottom already. You talk about, I believe the S&P 500 ETF is three basis points. So even if those go down to 
which maybe they will at, at some point, that really doesn't move the dial much for investors when you're talking about three one hundredths of a percent. But obviously, there's going to be massive change in the financial advisor space with a massive undercutting and big technological change from companies such as Schwab, because I'm sure Betterment and Vanguard won't be too far behind this. They'll be trying to catch up here. So I wanted to talk about if you are an advisor, what should you do about this? Well, obviously, you want to protect your profit margins. You want to protect your 1% fee. So the way to battle this is really just offering a superior service. And there's a number of areas you can focus on to offer a better service than Schwab can here and the other the other firms really um, pushing down price. Number one could be proprietary deal flow. Perhaps you can give clients access to unique securities or initial public offerings or something else that, that others can't get. Uh, the other thing is perhaps you can offer better advice. Perhaps you can put together better portfolios. You certainly can no longer rely on the commoditized portfolios that robo-advisors provide, like 60-40 uh, type things such as that. So if you can put together, uh, I'd say, more advanced model portfolios, that certainly could set set you apart. And so there's a number of things that advisors can do. I certainly Hope that they can start focusing on uh, on those uh, those growth opportunities and really staying in touch with clients and ultimately providing providing a higher touch services. Per- perhaps you can add more value on the tax side, on the estate planning side, on the insurance side. So there's also additional verticals that an advisor can expand to to just help keep that relationship such that their client doesn't defect to one of these uh, Schwab type offerings, although not coming out in Canada that I'm aware of. Yeah, and just to back up your points with some statistics is in terms of model portfolios, uh, Bank of America advisors are actually directing 29% of their assets to ETF model portfolios, as well as, you know, on a survey of advisors, what you're seeing is that advisors are only spending about 40% of their time on asset allocation now. Uh, in the past, that, that number has been a lot larger. And so what that means, it's like you had said, Advisors just have more time to add some of those more value add services and f- let the model portfolios take off some of that work. And t- Julian, what what are model portfolios exactly? So model portfolios are custom allocations to various asset classes. Say, you know, the the traditional model portfolio is the sixty forty uh, equities and bonds, but I don't really think that's uh, sufficient enough for most uh, to meet most investors' needs. So a model portfolio could include real estate, hedge funds, private equity, all sorts of uh, alternative strategies, perhaps, or a more diversified global portfolio, including international equities, emerging market bonds, currencies, government bonds, corporate credit, loans, high yield. So there are tons of asset classes that a model portfolio can incorporate, and it really depends on the client. And so the main benefit of these model portfolios is it really frees up advisors' time to focus on the client and interacting with the client, keeping that relationship beneficial for both and really working on meeting their needs. So I believe that what advisors can do and, and, and some more value add is really just utilize these model portfolios, really ease the burden of asset allocation and focus more on client relations, building, building their business and keeping clients happy. And today is March 29th, 2019, which is officially known as Independence Day for the UK or Brexit Day. But as you can see, that actually didn't happen. The UK continues to remain in the EU with really no plan to leave. So it's just uh, they're mired in a dysfunctional quagmire and lawmakers really can't agree on anything. So what happened this week? There are actually eight different proposals on Brexit that went through Parliament and British lawmakers actually voted against all of them, which is somewhat shocking because some of them, we were actual opposites of each other. So it seems like what we have here is just a really dysfunctional system where no one can get along. There's real, really no leadership. And it's tough to see any sort of way out of this. What are your thoughts on this, Mike? Yeah, I guess so. Elizabeth May, in, in her comments, she you know prior to the vote, she, she you know she issued warnings of 
future uncertainty and the possibility of no Brexit at all. But I guess you know, my, my comment would be uncertainty has been caused by her and her colleagues um, and no Brexit at all it may be favored by the country um, that, you know, it's it, it, at the very least it's uncertain where the country stands on this. And so do you think there's any way forward without May calling a general election? Who knows? No one really knows what's going to happen here. As I said, this has been a process. The initial referendum was in June 2016. So it's been over a thousand days and they've showed zero progress. The only thing that they've accomplished is massive international embarrassment for the country. But one positive thing to come out of this is that other countries within the EU, such as Italy, Greece, France, they have had nationalist parties that previously pitched the idea of leaving the EU. Now look at them. None of them have any interest in trying to leave uh, the European Union because they realize how much of an unmitigated disaster the UK has turned into. And when it comes down to it, they aren't able to leave in a way that they initially pitched to uh, voters that voted to leave. They thought they could keep all of the good and none of the bad, but it's turning out to be pretty much the opposite. And so they can't even uh, really come to any sort of agreement on any sort of exit from the EU. The next key date is April 12th, where they'll try to either seek another extension or just have a straight up Brexit or leave the EU without any sort of deal. And no politician wants to do that because that would just be dive bombing the UK economy into oblivion. No one wants to have that sort of blood on their hands. Um, you, you saw May even say she'd be willing to resign if they voted through her proposal. But thus far, no luck on that one. There's really no uh, any no sort of outlook um, or insight into where any of this is going. But I believe ultimately the best way forward and the most likely, it may not be consensus, but I think ultimately they'll end up at a second referendum. I believe the people have a right to vote again since they know how poorly uh, it's turned out and the leave camp were really just lied to they were told a bunch of really just falsehoods on what would happen if they voted to leave. And it certainly just hasn't turned out that way. Well, it, it was taking advantage of human nature. I think it was it, people are emotional about the subject. And in the original vote, I think that the, you know, the powers that be were f trying to garner a lot of those emotional factors in, in their favor. Um, and so though my overall view would be that, you know, it's an interesting dinner dinner party discussion, Brexit, that is, but the execution of which is is very difficult. And really what, what, what truly matters in this situation is execution. It's similar to running a company where, you know, the idea isn't the novel concept. It's the whole execution of the strategic business plan. And that's just something that you're you're not seeing here. Yeah, another really interesting aspect to consider. Now, the initial referendum was in 2016, so almost three years ago. If you look at the demographics back then, you had older people voting to leave, younger people wanting to remain. And so what's happened over the past three years is older people die off, younger people, more younger people become eligible to vote. So the thinking now is the initial referendum was so close you know, pretty much razor close, 50 point something percent to 49 point something percent. If you were to restage that referendum, a lot of people are highly confident that uh, the Remain would win, not just on the demographic changes, but also changing attitudes after they went through this whole quagmire over the past three years of really no progress being made. I think ultimately in 10 years, they'll look back and remember that Brexit thing where nothing ended up happening and the UK ended up staying in the EU. But stay tuned. We'll update you on any major developments, but uh, hopefully not too much because this isn't something we want to be talking about for the next three years, right? Agreed. Wanted to touch on our blog post this week and we entitled the podcast, Timing the Stock Market, Can You Do It? So in our blog this week, we touched on numerous stock market timing indicators. Since we've been talking about the inverted yield curve so much, we figured we'd touch on that and a number of other indicators that have worked historically, but 
most of them have gone on to not work. And so the, the reasoning here is that in the market, uh, it's a, a parimutuel system where traders and investors, the more they you know, bid something up, then odds get reflected in the price, right? And so if everyone is using the same indicator and everyone believes that indicator works, then it'll certainly stop working because people have an effect on the outcome. This, the trading of the stock affects the odds, which will get rid of the effectiveness of the indicator. So the first one I want to t- touch on is just the dividend yield of the S&P 500 versus the uh, bond yield of the 10-year uh, treasury bond. So historically, at least between 1928 and 1958, treasuries yielded uh, 2 to 5% more consistently than the dividend yield of the S&P 500. So this went on for decades until 1958, when the yield on the 10-year bond exceeded that of the S&P 500 for the first time. And it effectively exceeded that and never looked back until, uh, I think, around 2010. So if you're relying on that indicator, If you would only buy stocks when they're yielding more than bonds, the theory being that you want to have a higher income compensation uh, to take on the greater risk of owning stocks, if you would have utilized that signal to exit stocks in 1958, that would have been a horrible decision because you would have missed out on a generational stock rally for the next 50 years. Um, So that's one indicator. The next one, and this is one that I actually really like, is the Buffett indicator. So what this does, and obviously uh, coined by Warren Buffett, it compares the total market capitalization of U.S. stocks as measured by the Wilshire 5000, and it compares that to a U.S. GDP. So I want to quote Warren Buffett here. He says, if the percentage relationship falls to the 70 percent to 80 percent area, buying stocks is likely to work out well for you. If the ratio approaches 200 percent, as it did in 1999 and part of 2000, you are playing with fire. So Warren Buffett ran a highly successful investment partnership, one of the first ever hedge funds. Uh, started in the 50s and ultimately shut it down in uh, 1969. Once he couldn't really find any uh, very attractive investments that he could typically find relatively easy. And in 1969, also what happened was that this Buffett indicator, the market cap to GDP, crossed 80% to the upside for the first time. So that really concerned him. He shut down his partnership and ultimately uh, exited stocks, which was quite a good timing on his part because there was a pretty brutal bear market in, I believe, 73, 74 that took stocks down dramatically, took his peers down pretty hard. I remember Charlie Munger had a pretty rough uh, early 70s and it took him quite a while to recoup that. That was, I believe that crash was the Nifty 50 stocks, um, which Howard Marks always discusses that crash where it was actually very high quality stocks that were going down uh, as a, that investors thought were you know, invincible. Buy at any price. And I believe they ultimately bought them up to 70 times earnings, which was far too high of a valuation that they just couldn't sustain. But if we get back to this, that stock crash actually brought the uh, Buffett indicator back to a reasonable level. It stayed around the 40 to 60% range for a while and didn't cross 80% again until 1995. Once it went past that, really never looked back. It stayed above 80%, aside from briefly touching below that at the depths of the credit crisis in 2008, 2009. But here's another indicator that if you followed that, and it was an indicator promoted by the greatest investor of all time, if you followed that, then you would have been out of stocks for a long time. Since 1995, the S&P 500 provided a total return of over 700%. And even Buffett didn't listen to his own indicator. He was obviously running Berkshire Hathaway throughout that time period, and that company will remain heavily invested in stocks. And Berkshire's total return 1995 uh, to current was almost 1,200%. And so another timing indicator that has worked in the past, but uh, certainly has a spotty track record. CAPE, or the cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio, is another indicator. So what this does, it's a valuation measure, and it averages real earnings per share over a 10-year period to generate a smoother long-term earnings profile. This is one similar to the Buffett in- indicator that had uh, pretty good signaling pre-1995. Cape averaged 15 times, but after 1995, it exceeded 15 times and really never looked back. 
This was another indicator that, similar to the Buffett indicator, if you listen to this one, it would have kept you out of stock since 1995, save for that uh, brief period during the credit crisis. And I believe CAPE only dipped below 15 times for maybe a month or two in spring 2009. And, and that's about it. Oh, a classic Baltic Dry Index. So if you're investing throughout that credit crisis, this was a pretty popular index back then. What this index measured was a composite of freight shipping rates. And it was regarded as a general shipping market bellwether. I don't know if you've ever heard of Dr. Copper, but they say uh, the price of copper is uh, an economist with a PhD, right? And so here's another sort of economic indicator, the Baltic Dry Index, that people looked at for guidance as a leading indicator on where the economy and ultimately stocks are going. If we look at 2006 to 2009, uh, up until 2008, the Baltic Dry Index really rallied as the market followed. And then the Baltic Dry Index crashed during the credit crisis, bringing stocks with it. Both the Baltic Dry and the S&P 500 rallied into 2010, but then 2010 came and the Baltic Dry Index really stalled out and then started a long-term decline. So many people would have taken this as a sign to get out of stocks, but if you remember, stocks just continued to rally uh, since 2010 or, and are up multiples since then. Meanwhile, the Baltic Dry Indicator remains near all-time lows, what happened there was there's was a supply side response, pretty much too many ships being built, and that brought uh, shipping supply way too high, really crushing prices. So there's an indicator that also stopped working. When you uh, when you mention the uh, the Baltic Dry Index and looking at the actual chart of it, it actually reminds me of something that Derek Uwale, the our head of research, always says is that correlations are not static; that they are constantly changing. And so, to kind of be wary of anybody who's mentioning a correlation as just a singular static number, is when you look at that chart, it's very clear that there's no single correlation of those uh, b- between the Baltic Dry Index and stocks. Exactly. The next one, the last one we want to check out is the inverted yield curve. This has been in the news a lot since a week ago, the yield curve in the US and more recently Canada inverted. And as we previously talked about in the podcast, the US yield curve inversion has a very good historical track record, at least since the 50s, of predicting recession and bear market. The Canadian yield curve, more mixed in terms of its success, it's had some hit and misses. One thing I wanted to touch on is although the US yield curve inversion does have a good historical predictive ability in predicting uh, recessions six to 24 months out, we want to look at the SP 500 returns since the yield curve inverts, because that's not nearly as clear. And I think it's more of a coin flip. If we look at the 12 month change after a yield curve inversion, there's the numbers are anywhere from a negative 25% drawdown to a positive 38% return. And if we average those out over a good eight to 10 observations, you get 1.2%. And then 24 months after yield curve inversion, It's also a wide range from negative 26% to 52.5% to the positive, averaging out at 8.6%. So in conclusion, our advice is not try to time the market. There's no reliable indicators. If there was a reliable indicator, everyone would start using it, hence making it useless because that's how markets function. So the best advice here, have good long-term capital allocation in addition to having a real long-term view of your investments. Don't get spooked out of the market. You can expect a bear market in stocks once or twice every 10 years. So keep that in mind. Make sure you're not too highly levered in the market. Make sure you hold some bonds and some spare cash to capitalize on any opportunities that may come. And that's it, ladies and gents, for episode seven of the Absolute Return podcast. Be sure to check out more episodes on absolutereturnpodcast.com, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Make sure to give us a review as well. Cheers. Talk to you next week.
Thanks for tuning in to the Absolute Return Podcast. This episode was brought to you by Accelerate Financial Technologies. Accelerate, because performance matters. Find out more at accelerateshares.com. The views expressed in this podcast are the personal views of the participants and do not reflect the views of Accelerate. No aspect of this podcast constitutes investment, legal, or tax advice. Opinions expressed in this podcast should not be viewed as a recommendation or solicitation of an offer to buy or sell any securities or investment strategies. The information and opinions in this podcast are based on current market conditions and may fluctuate and change in the future. No representation or warranty, expressed or implied, is made on behalf of Accelerate. As to the accuracy or completeness of the information contained in this podcast. Accelerate does not accept any liability for any direct, indirect, or consequential loss or damage suffered by any person as a result of relying on all or any part of this podcast, and any liability is expressly disclaimed.